Welcome to Shred Show, I'm Chris, and this is the weirdest shit we've ever done on the internet's most stoked surfboard show. This board won best of show at the 2012 boardroom convention, and you're likely to find it in the quiver of surf guide in the Maldives, Michael Lester, seen here with his 5'11 slip-in and 5'11 girlfriend. It's also a favorite of Santa Cruz local Josh Mulcoy, who likes his slip-in in Mexican right-handers, like the one that we see here, and single fin enthusiast Eric Gieselman, who has this board on rotation in Florida, seen here putting it to work at Sebastian Inlet. But of all the places you may have seen this board, the most likely is in Red Bull's Decades Project, where Jamie O'Brien stayed happy in waves far below pipeline standards on this board. If you haven't seen that yet, you can find it in the YouTube info below. If you watch that, you'll also find Chloe and Dino surfing this shape. Designing this board is Thomas Mayerhofer, surfing for 25 years and creating boards for seven. He's very controversial because from his home on the beach in Montara, California, he's designed uncommon shapes like the XYZ while also running a design studio with clients like Coca-Cola. Previously, he worked with iPhone creator Johnny Ive and Steve Jobs back when Apple took its first steps to literally changing everything in the 90s. Now, for some who want surfboards today to be built and distributed the same way that they were 40 years ago by people who have spent their entire life in a shape Bay. This is a very big no-no. But to others, Mayerhofer boards represent an exciting progression in the future of shape. While I understand both sides of the argument from people who embrace new things and others who just want surfing's heritage to stay intact, what stands out to me is that we've got someone who could be making like 20 times more per hour spending his time on different things, but devoting much of his days to tinkering with floatable toys. Before this board came to surf shops, as you see it today, it went through nearly 40 prototypes where it was surfed in tested to get what you can feel up now in a shop, and that testing eventually led to the creation of a new fin, so for all you people who keep telling me to talk more about fins, put on your party hats because it's about to happen now. Single fin surfboards are often praised for their ability to hold speed in a straight line, often referenced as gliding or trimming, because while the leading two fins and a thruster create speed when you pump the board, the toe angle on those leading two fins, that's the angle at which the leading two fins on a thruster, if this was a thruster, don't aim straight forward like this. Instead, those fins are towed in so that the leading edge points up towards the pointed nose of your shortboard. Anyway, that toe angle of the leading two fins slows the board down as it moves in a straight line. Additionally, even though quads generate excellent speed when pumped and gyrated, each additional fin that you add to the bottom of a surfboard creates a new location of drag, commonly thought to slow down straight line speed. Single fins are fast because there's only one fin on the bottom of the board creating drag when the board is going in a straight line, as we can see here in this Red Bull footage. But much of the reason that we're not surfing single fins today, like most surfers back from the 50s all the way up until the 80s, is that when you take a single fin off of its straight line speed and try to turn it, you don't feel that unique transition of speed through your turn, commonly called thrust or boost or projection, that you do feel when you're surfing a thruster. Some who don't like traditional single fins even go as far as saying that they decelerate in turns and don't hold speed at all. It's hard though to make sweeping statements because the number of single fin shapes, constructions, and styles are numerous, as are the design intricacies of single fin boards across different shapers. A single fin like this one with an upright stature is designed to pivot quickly, while a more raked back fin like this one will create a wider turn. This fin though seems to be trying to do two different things at once. It's actually very upright through this portion of the fin while it sweeps back for wide turns here. These materials also work to create extra stiffness through the upright portion of the fin where you see this carbon and increased flex through the swept portion of the fin where we see this honeycomb. We can see this working as the stiff upright section holds the face and helps the board pivot and the swept honeycomb tip loads up and springs the board out of this turn. Lastly, this fin is slightly narrower, right about here when you compare it to other flex fins of similar size. This increased narrowness right here means that the fin may pivot slightly better in the water when compared to another fin that would be wider right here. And it also increases the amount of flex that you would feel at this point in the fin because there's less material here, which inhibits bend even less. Having said that, what's most important in any
any single fin when it comes to the way it feels beneath your feet while you're surfing it is where you place the fin in the box. Here we see lost footage of Chris Ward on a Mark Richards single fin and we can watch him slide out from lack of hold in the face of this barrel. He then goes to the beach to adjust the fin, moving it back in the fin box for less pivot and slide and more hold. If you watch the rest of this footage below, you'll find him making barrel after barrel after this fin adjustment in some of the cleanest beach break conditions ever with the added stability he feels having that one fin pushed way back in the box. A good rule is starting off with your single fin at about the center of the box and then moving it in quarter to a half inch increments forward if you want to feel more of a loose pivot, most likely useful in smaller weaker waves like we see Eric surfing here and he actually surfs this board with the fin moved all the way up in the fin box. Or move it backward in the same increments until you find the stiff hold that you want to feel. Commonly desired in barreling waves like we see Kyle Buffman surfing an early slip-in prototype on in the Maldives. Because that fin placement lets him access steeper, deeper parts of the barrel with more secure hold in the face. Now getting to the shape of this board, it is really difficult to look at this thing at first glance and feel anything other than intense confusion. What stands out immediately on this board is obviously the tail. If you were to follow the outline from here and follow this natural curve and let it go back intuitively to where you think a board is going to curve around, you would basically just have a rounded thumb tail. Instead, this board has what Thomas Mayerhofer calls a negative cut. This is very different than the side cuts you've seen, like the extreme side cuts on the Mirandan Porpoise or more subtle ones on Hayden's psychedelic germ. You see, those boards cut into the plan shape like this, but then they curve back out before they get to a more common tail shape. But this negative cut goes straight back. I think that the simplest way to view this is that as you move your back foot further back onto the board, the board becomes much easier to sink and pivot and stall. The board gets very narrow very quickly, and that makes it easier to re-angle in places like up in the lip. Contrast that with how wide the rest of this shape is and you can see a lot of potential for really dancing around while you surf this. Here Josh Mulcoy uses that narrow tail to slow down and position himself for the line he's about to draw. Then he dances his front foot up and takes a big step forward with his back foot, placing himself far forward on the wide area of this board where he planes smoothly across the face, cleanly holding to his straight line before exiting at the end, where he then dances both feet back to direct the board vertically up the face, then re-angles it tightly back down from the lip. After your first glance, you can really look at this board and see that it's not just that the tail looks weird, but that three-fourths of the board is really wide and one-fourth of the board is really narrow. And most interestingly, there's a surprisingly short distance the outline has to cover to make such a drastic change in width. To me, this means that this board offers two very different planing surfaces in a single board because of the way that you can weight the board in the back and decrease the functional planing surface that you're surfing on by lifting the forward part of the board out of the water as you move forward. And then you can increase planing surface area very quickly by accessing this part of the board moving your weight up to experience that trim and glide. The outline of this board could also tell you quite a bit about how this board will paddle and feel while you catch waves. The width forward obviously implies pretty easy paddling, but all the narrowness back here makes it seem like you could feel a sinking sensation between your knees, shins, and quads. That means this board takes energy from the wave very differently than something like a McCoy Nugget with its very wide, thick, round tail. If you were surfing that board, you're likely to be paddling for a wave for example, imagine a wave is coming from back there and you're paddling this way. On that McCoy nugget, you would feel the tail floating up to the top, the crest of the wave, because there's so much buoyancy in it, and then you'd kind of get kicked off it and drop down the wave like this. Whereas this board that has much more narrowness back here, it is not very thick, this board sinks more in the tail into the face of the wave as you're paddling for it, so you kind of feel like you're being lifted up with less of a vertical incline in your board, you're more sunk into the wave, and you get to your feet and kind of take off this way. Rolled V in the nose, still a rolled V. Tiny concave on either side. Definite V, concave really out towards the rails. Really big V. I could do this all day. This is really interesting because a V this deep and long is most commonly used across wider boards, especially wider boards back in the tail to help those boards transition from rail to rail more easily. But the last 12 inches of this board is already so narrow, it seems like it would feel smooth on its own without so much V. If we measure the rocker on this, when I measure 
are the rocker on this board. I get one and 15 sixteenths in the tail and four and one eighths in the nose, which is an incredibly low nose and tail rocker. So you could kind of look at this board as being in the tail at least, very low rockered in the tail, very narrow and shaped to sit down in the water. Kind of like a trailing rudder behind your back foot that smooths everything out without any slip or slide because everything is constantly connected behind you. Finally, much of the low nose rocker on this board is likely due to chopping off the front six inches of the nose like this. You can see that on a short board at least, this part of the nose would come out to a point from either rail. That obviously eliminates some of the natural curve that a more pointy nose would follow, thus decreasing the total measurement of nose rocker. And that also reduces swing weight. You'd probably find that this board feels faster in a straight line than your thruster does, and you'd probably also notice that compared to your single fin, it pivots more tightly off the bottom going vertical and redirects more quickly and immediately up in the lip. It's probably most fun in clean lined up waves that offer a clear path to a far distant shoulder, because even even though this board can be surfed in a little bit more high performance of a way than a normal single fin, any surfer could probably appreciate the unique sensation of being really far up on this much width with one fin trailing so far behind your back foot. That could give you a glide and a trim that you probably haven't experienced before, especially if you usually surf standard quads and thrusters. Now Shred Nation to possibly win a pair of my favorite Smith sunglasses, the Mount Shasta. Drop a comment down below telling us what the weirdest board you have ever surfed is or what is the weirdest board that you want to surf. At the end of the week we'll pick one of you and send you some fresh sunnies. Until then we hope the waves are up at whatever body of water you call home and we'll see you soon on Shred Show.